So we're gonna switch gears in this panel, and this is our um, trade war and uh, industrial policy panel. We are very pleased to have an outstanding group of speakers. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them. Do you have the bios? Our first speaker will be Professor G. Brenstetter from Carnegie Mellon University. If you want to learn about innovation, technology, industry policy, R&D, <laughs> solar panel industry, I don't know, you name it, go to uh, Lee's website. Our, um, so actually th this morning's panelist, uh, Matt Wiesmeyer, has already touched upon some of the issues on Made in China 2025, and um, Lee is going to tell us all about it, um, the effects of Chinese industry policy. Our second speaker is one of my go-to people, experts on trade policy. I've been following his work since he was in Brandeis. So um, Chad has worked in academia, the World Bank, next to my office, we, we were next door to each other, and then White House Council of Economic Advisors, Peterson, and to more recently, one of the most popular podcast hosts, um, Trade Talk. So if you have not downloaded uh, Chad's Trade Talk podcast, you should do so. Uh, I listen to it, I wouldn't say every day, but on my drive to work before I teach my students. So I highly recommend that. And then our third speaker, Professor Jennifer Hillman, who is currently in Georgetown, and she has had a distinguished career in public services, both nationally and internationally, including more recently, one of the seven members of the WTO's appellate body. So we're very pleased to have all three of you to talk about um, our current trade situation and, uh, and the race of the policy. Welcome, and Lee, please. All right, well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here, the invitation. Uh, it's been great to connect with old friends, colleagues, uh, and meet some new folks, and I've learned a great deal already. I guess the next thing I need to learn is how to advance the slide. I guess I'll just press this thing right there. No, no. Ah, there we go. Okay, there we go. Uh, learning yet something else. Um, so I need to begin by uh, acknowledging and thanking uh, my former students and co-authors, Wang Wei Li and Meng Jia Ren. Uh, they played uh, an incredibly central role, the central role, in terms of generating all the scientific substance in the papers from which I'll about to draw. However, any controversial statements I might make about U.S. policy or Chinese policy should be ascribed to me alone uh, and not, not to either of my co-authors. All right. All right, so um, China's uh, Chinese government's direct subsidies to farm have been uh, firms have been growing in scale and controversy uh, in recent years. Uh, subsidies related to China's Made in China 2025 uh, program have been especially controversial. Probably everybody in the room knows about this program introduced in 2015. Um, at least uh, in principle, it's a it's a plan. And it follows on a number of earlier plans that are designed to move China from being a low-cost manufacturer of commodity products to an innovation-driven economy at the global frontier, whose indigenous firms are lead technological leaders in their industries. Um, this has been criticized. This program has been criticized by many of China's trading partners, not just the U.S., uh, also countries in Western Europe and elsewhere. Um, because the allegation is that uh, these subsidies appear to be trade distorting. They appear to be contrary to the spirit and perhaps the letter of the WTO disciplines China signed up for when they joined the WTO. And I'm not saying that this is, uh, you know, an indication of accurate analysis, but the Trump administration used Made in China 2025 as part of its justification for launching the trade war. So what is the Chinese government seeking to promote with, you know, these, these subsidy programs, especially made in China 2025? Right? I think you can go back all the way back to the medium and long-term plan uh, of 2006, and you can see a, a central theme that runs through a number of major policy documents that all attest to the centrality 
of promoting productivity growth <laughs> through indigenous innovation. Right, so there are many in this audience who are familiar with these documents. Many of you can read them fluently in the original Mandarin. Um, you know, this is not really a surprise. And let's be clear, China is now at a point where the catch-up phase of economic growth is probably ending or perhaps already over. China's labor force is shrinking. Returns to capital investment appear to be falling. Productivity growth has decelerated significantly in recent years. To sustain growth, China needs to become more productive, right? And part of that could come through indigenous innovation. So there's a sense in which the government's policy priority is well placed. But as I've already noted, at least in the eyes of its um, its trading partners, and you know, I'll say you know, Western here, but the notion of Western that I'm referring to includes industrial East Asian democracies like Japan and South Korea. These trading partners um, you know, view China's industrial policies through these subsidies as emphasizing government support to supplant Western technology leaders with indigenous Chinese national champions. And so they have seen increasingly these subsidies as trade distorting, and these Western trading partners are in the process, to varying degrees, of implementing expensive, and I would argue risky, countermeasures to limit or reverse the impact of Chinese subsidies. Okay. But is it working? I mean, anybody who's gone through, gone through a home renovation knows you can spend a lot of money and still not get what you want, <laughs> right? So, you know, I mean, it's an open question as to whether these subsidies are achieving the government's policy aims. And if they're not, then I would argue that it might be a mistake for Western nations to spend lots of resources trying to counter policies that are not in the first instance very successful. And you know, I stand here in Washington, D.C., right? I, I see a, 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 an intergenerational audience. Uh, I'm probably not the only one who remembers when there were a lot of people in this town who believed that Japanese industrial policy posed a real challenge to America's high-tech uh, industries. And these experts counseled radical changes to U.S. trade and technology policy as a necessary response. Mm -hmm. Should like home in 1980s pop tune at this point. <laughs> so we've been making the same mistake all over again, right? What can data tell us about the efficacy of Chinese industrial policy? So uh, we um, are going to take the position of not, you know, sort of looking at what the Chinese government says it's doing, but what it's actually doing. And we take advantage of data available since 2007. Uh, that comes out of a requirement that Chinese listed companies disclose the subsidies that they receive and even describe the purpose for which these subsidies were received as part of their annual reports. Now, uh, are Chinese companies, you know, being, uh, you know, completely honest in their annual reports? Are they telling us the whole truth, you know, the truth and nothing but the truth? Maybe not. Um, but to the best of our knowledge, our papers are actually the first uh, papers to utilize these firm level subsidy data to examine what the subsidies are for as indicated by text in the annual reports. And you can use natural language processing software to parse that and categorize sub subsidies in their different categories. What characteristics of the firm are associated with the firm being a recipient of subsidies? Uh, what is the firm level impact of receiving subsidies? Um, and I know that, you know, there are Professor Gu and other, you know, labor economists are in the room, right? Uh, we're going to be looking at correlations, we're not going to be making strong causal statements, but what we're going to see is that even the positive associations or correlations that we might expect to see, if these things are actually successful, we manifestly do not see, no matter how we slice it. And we also want to focus on subsidies that we can associate directly with the Made in China 2025 program given its prominence. So our main finding is that subsidies fail to boost recipient firms' productivity. Now, you might think that if this policy is well-designed, subsidies will be going to the more productive Chinese enterprises that have a good chance of becoming, the national champions, right, who will drive indigenous innovation. It doesn't go to more productive firms. It goes to less productive. 
What we also see of that is that if anything, right, firms that receive these subsidies tend to become less productive after they receive them than before. And there's no statistical evidence that the Made in China 2025 initiative, as we measure it in our paper, has led to increases in labor productivity, total factor productivity, patenting, or profitability. So whatever else they may be doing, the subsidies that we're measuring in the aggregate do not appear to be the kind of productivity enhancing, indigenous innovating, promoting, innovate, indigenous innovation promoting policy that the state and party claim they are. So at this point, the non-economists, you know, might want to, you know, step back, you know, uh, see how their stock portfolio is doing. Um, <laughs> what do we do empirically? We use a very standard economic technique to measure the productivity of Chinese listed firms using, um, you know, slightly processed, a slightly processed version of the data that they disclose as part of their annual reports. Okay. Um, and there are some details here uh, about, you know, some of the limitations of the data and the exact technique that we use. I mean, the bottom line is we're using a pretty standard technique and we're applying it as best we can, right, to data that aren't quite as complete as we'd like them. All right. This allows us to compute productivity for every listed Chinese firm in every year, right, relative to other firms in their industry. Right. And then we basically explore the relationship between productivity, as we've measured it, and subsidies. Right. Um, are more productive firms getting the subsidies? Does receiving the subsidies make firms more productive after they receive them? So uh, I, I I'm not quite sure how I'm doing on time, but uh, I can go through this pretty quickly. Ah, okay, I'm not doing so well on time, so it's a good thing that I'm going through this pretty quickly. <laughs> um, subsidies are allocated to less productive firms, right? TFP, total factor productivity, is kind of the best concept economists have created to capture this idea of productivity, right? And that's negatively correlated with subsidy allocation, controlling for a bunch of other stuff. Even if we focus on the subset of subsidies that the text in the annual report identifies as related to R&D or innovation or equipment upgrading, there's no positive association between the allocation of these subsidies and the productivity of the receiving firm. And do firms get more productive after they get these subsidies? No, right? If anything, the effect is negative and actually statistically significant. And again, even if we focus, um, you know, on uh, the um, uh, subset of subsidies that seem to be explicitly targeted at innovation, according to firm disclosures, this is also not uh, positively raising uh, firm productivity after receiving the subsidy. What do subsidies subsidies boost, if anything? I mean, the, the best we can make from the data is there seems to be a positive effect. It's a bit mixed, but there seems to be a positive effect with employment, which might make sense if we're talking about a regime that, you know, wants to avoid instability and is willing to prop up unproductive or unprofitable enterprises in order to achieve that goal. But there's not much of a connection with productivity. So what about being China 2025? Right, so we've got firm level data but it was harder to use this firm level data to evaluate the impact of Made in China 2025 subsidies than we expected because the Chinese government has never officially disclosed which firms participate in the program. So what we did was again, we went to the annual reports, right, in Chinese, and we used natural language processing software to identify when the annual report actually mentioned the Made in China 2025 program, as in, the Made in China 2025 program has been launched and shareholders, you should be happy because we expect to benefit from it. So identifying firms that did and did not participate in the Made in China 2025 program allows us to use an econometric approach called difference and differences. Don't worry about the details, right? It's kind of uh, what economists do, or one of the things that they do. Uh, we also uh, took a panel event study approach the bottom line, and these coefficients uh, and uh, you know, column labels made it a little bit hard to read in the back, but the bottom line is that receipt of these subsidies appears to do uh, not much. 
right? Uh, it does uh, seem to raise uh, the R&D to sales ratio. So there is some evidence that it boosts R&D spending, at least as disclosed by the firm. But it does not increase patenting in China. It does not increase patenting in the United States. It does not increase labor productivity. It does not increase total factor productivity. And it does not increase profitability. Now, these findings come with some important caveats. We're looking at listed companies, right? There are lots of companies that are not, not listed. The vast majority of Chinese firms are not listed. And we're also only looking at one component of the total subsidies received by Chinese firms, right? So we cannot, in these data, account for de facto subsidies that firms receive through tax breaks, preferential loans from state-owned banks, uh, preferential provision of cheap land, favorable government uh, procurement contracts, et cetera. But we do know that our results are consistent with an emerging literature that calls into question the efficacy of Chinese industrial policy, especially this newer innovation focused version using a wide range of data sets. <clears throat> so these are our conclusions. Now I'm gonna step away from what I think is a somewhat firm evidentiary basis and I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to ask the question, why? Right? Why does the policy not seem to be achieving the aims that have been stressed oh, thank you, in multiple policy documents? And I think the, the very speculative answer that I would like to suggest might be true is that industrial policy is hard for everybody. Remember that literature on Japanese industrial policy? How many people in the room actually read Japan as number one by Ezra Vogel? I'm so glad I'm not the only one. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, when economists actually went to the data and chugged the numbers, what they found was that those Japanese industrial policy mandarins were actually doing no better in the heyday of Japanese industrial policy than China's policy mandarins were doing. It turns out governments inevitably have conflicting objectives. They want to promote disruptive innovation, but they want stability. They want to pick the winners, but they want to compensate the losers. They want to be everything, everywhere, all at once. And unless you're Michelle Yeah, it's really hard to pull that off. Right? Identifying firms that can invent the technologies of tomorrow that we haven't even thought of yet is a lot harder than identifying the firms that can copy the technologies of today. Just ask your friendly neighborhood venture capitalists. <laughs> and it turns out that firms and regional governments tend to respond opportunistically to central government objectives, uh, initiatives, in ways that can undermine uh, the sought after outcomes. Right? Um, this was something that was an anticipated decades ago by the strategic trade theorists that were trying to think through the implications of Japanese industrial policy back in the day. And lots of empiricists see exactly these patterns in empirical studies on Chinese industrial policy in our current moment. So if Chinese industrial policy as it is being practiced doesn't seem to be working as intended, then let me, let me humbly suggest you know, to our friends across town that maybe we shouldn't copy this policy that is not working. Maybe we should think about a different approach. What might some elements of that approach be how about vastly increasing the level of high-skilled immigration the United States allows in the name of national security, which seems to be the only way to break the legislative logjam uh, on Capitol Hill? The biggest constraint to our national technological progress is the absence of good engineers. But this constraint is largely self-generated in the United States because millions would come if we would let them. How about? We like them. We could also invest government money in the things that economics tells us markets don't do, right? Invest more money in pre-commercial basic scientific research. Invest more money in educating our people. Invest more money in a 21st century infrastructure. And try and aggressively mint our workers, our inventors, our engineers into the global system that the United States helped build, right? That has benefited China, right? Uh, but also us 
and our partners, because the simple fact of the matter is that China has scale. And even if it remains much less productive than the United States forever, it is probably going to become a larger economy in absolute economic size in our lifetimes, maybe in relatively short order. But it's hard to imagine China becoming larger than the entire Western system. And again, I'm defining this broadly to include the East Asian industrial democracies in the foreseeable future. And not breaking that up, but making it stronger would seem to be a really good way to proceed. Finally, we can invest in a safety net that cushions our workers and our firms against the disruption that innovation and trade inevitably generate. I will stop there. Thank you very much. Hey, um, thanks, Lee. That was great. I'm basically not going to disagree with anything Lee said, so it's going to be really boring. Um, uh, what, my, what I'm going to try to do is to explain what it is the United States is. So, you know, today's about U.S. and China. We've heard a lot about the Chinese side so far. Um, we haven't heard as much about the United States side. Um, in the United States, we do industrial policy now, too. <laughs> so I wanted to try to uh, explain what's been happening a little bit from somebody who's been tracking it for the last couple of years. And it's funny, I was thinking about earlier this morning, uh, the last time I was here at the conference, and I think I might have been presenting a paper that I did with Jennifer Hillman, who's going to come right after me. Uh, you know, it was like the take takedown of the Chinese industrial policy and the Chinese system of subsidies. And uh, so ignore everything that it, from a rules based perspective. Rules. Okay. In any case, today we're going to talk about what the United States is doing. And I have this mildly provocative title A New Paradigm or Just a Practical Policy Response to Real World Shocks in the New Geopolitical Climate. And partially it's not provocative, but there's a lot of talk in, in Washington about throwing out of the you know, neoliberal something economic system. And that's what this industrial policy shift is all about. Maybe, um, but I'm not sure yet. And, and um, are we becoming more like China? Maybe, right? And I think there's, we has laid out explicitly um, the concerns about going down that path. Um, but another way of interpreting sort of what's happened so far in a case that I will uh, make a, a, at least partially is that this, can be seen as kind of a practical policy response to real world shocks um, and a new geopolitical climate that we're confronting. Uh, and so to make that case, or to try to put it at least in context, I'm gonna walk through the, the four probably most important examples of industrial policy that have taken place since the last time I was in this room in 2019, personal protective equipment, COVID vaccines, uh, what we've seen on semiconductors, and now what we're seeing on clean energy through inflation reduction. Okay, so let's go through PPE, right? And here the story was pandemic hits, hits first in China. Um, what was the problem? Well, we sort of had the, the perfect storm of shocks, right? So the first country that was hit with the pandemic was China. Uh, and China happens to be, so we're thinking about personal protective equipment. This is surgical masks, respirators, uh, gowns, gloves, hair nets, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and we can all remember if you were living in, in the United States at the time, shortages at hospitals, you know, doctors and nurses had to wear garbage bags and uh, reuse stuff that shouldn't have been reused. And this was seemingly incomprehensible because these are not hard products to make at all, right? But the challenge was, uh, and in some of these product lines, especially we weren't making them really anymore in the United States. Um, we were just buying them from low cost suppliers all over the world. And China happens to be a sort of the residual source of supply. And so when China was hit, and that's what this uh, chart up here on the right hand side shows for a number of different products. When China was hit with the pandemic first, markets reacted as one would expect. China stopped exporting this stuff to the world because it needed it desperately at home. It actually started importing a little bit from the rest of the and so that was, you know, January, February. And so then when the pandemic spreads globally to Europe in February, the United States, New York City in March, et cetera, uh, we're looking around for, for, for these supplies. And there's, you know, we, we can't really make that much here. We quickly go through our stockpiles and we can't get enough quickly from China because China still hasn't scaled up enough to be able to supply the world. And it's still using a lot because it was the pandemic first, right? So this is just sort of natural uh, and it's unfortunate, of course, wasn't anything really nefarious, which is sort of the perfect form of, shock, of 
perfect storm of shocks. The residual supplier of this stuff is where the pandemic hit first and took global supplies off, off of markets. Um, so what do you, what, what's the sort of best, first best policy response to deal with that, to sort of prevent that sort of thing from happening in the future? Well, uh, and, and have we done it? Well, what we did do in the United States uh, shortly starting thereafter, so beginning in, in April over the next year and a half or so, is we invested over a billion dollars in building out, at, you know, sort of an in, in, in intense domestic supply chain for personal protective equipment. Um, all those things that I mentioned, gloves, you know, the, the rubber that you need for these things, um, you know, all of the key inputs. Um, the Department of Defense spent a lot of money and we now have one of those. So what's the right policy response and, and what's the role for industrial policy there? Um, well, obviously, better stockpiling management, uh, probably bigger stockpiles, right, to help you get through a, a period of time in which you can't ramp up production or find find uh, from alternative sources if you can import from other sources. So better stockpiling and management is one. Diversification of sourcing. So when you look at the data, it was true that we were primarily sourcing um, and the world was primarily sourcing from China. It was something like 50, 60, 70% of world exports of a lot of these different products. And then maybe there's a, a small argument to say having some basic domestic production capacity that you can scale up, that you need to keep warm, right, during downtimes in the event of a, a, an emergency like that, because, and this was a, as one of the White House um, leaders of the, of the PPE supply chain uh, efforts during that era put it, because you can't surge zero, right? If you have basically no production facilities at all, it's hard to, you know, get that to scale up very, very quickly. Whereas if you have some basic production, you can expand that. And so that's sort of the, the starting point. And then we did this industrial policy. Um, will industrial policy work? Um, probably not in, in and of itself, right? In terms of sustaining this as, a, as an industry uh, over the long run for the United States, just because we're not a low cost provider of a lot of these products, which are very, very labor intensive. Um, so in order to maintain at least a baseline industry in the United States for these, and maybe you want to have this for pandemic preparedness reasons, right? To be able to scale up production uh, in, a, in an emergency, uh, you're going to need to come up with policies to ensure that. That's going to mean probably some combination of tariffs, subsidies, discriminatory government procurement policies that say buy American of this stuff, even though it's more expensive, that's going to be costlier for consumers and already in you know, costly American healthcare context costly for, for taxpayers. Um, but if that's important for pandemic preparedness, okay, but it's gonna to need to be budgeted for, accounted for, and, and, and kind of thought through, and that's unfortunately the reality. But something that we probably could do better than we've done in the past is to recognize that many countries have the same challenges that we do. And if we're now in a new geopolitical climate where we can't trust China going forward for these kinds of supplies, even though there was no evidence during the pandemic that you know the geopolitical tensions played any role in it, lacking access to these kinds of things, but maybe it would in the future as tensions worsen. Uh, there's lots of other countries out there in the world that we could manage this process with as well. So it doesn't all have to be industrial policy. Okay, second example, COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so obviously when the pandemic hit, what did we need? We needed novel vaccines. So we needed to research them, invent them in the first place, uh, develop them, send them through expensive, costly, time-consuming clinical trials, and then we needed to produce them at scale and speed, right? The entire world needed these things. Everybody needed these things and we needed them as quickly as possible because millions of people were dying and trillions of dollars of economic activity were being lost because of lockdowns to the economy, uh, snarls and supply chains and things like that. So the United States actually out of all of the countries in the world probably did the best in terms of getting the, the, the combinations of policies right and the manufacturing ties. To, to, to make this happen. The subsidies that the federal government granted through Operation Warp Speed were early. They were diversified, meaning we picked a bunch of candidates to subsidize. Everybody knows Pfizer and Moderna, Ooh, they're great, but we actually paid out billions of dollars to, to vaccines that never, were never actually deployed in the United States, AstraZeneca, right? The Novavax vaccine that took forever to come along, finally did, but wasn't really ever used. But that's okay, it was diversification. You know, if the Moderna or Pfizer hadn't worked or the Johnson & Johnson, it worked sort of okay, but we had manufacturing problems at the main facility in the United States that was, that was producing it. 
that diversification allowed us to overcome those hurdles. So that's all, all, all good as well. But the advanced market commitments, not only were these subsidies early, um, but they incentivized the firms. They sort of shifted the risk from the firms onto the government in case they're phase three trials. They're big clinical trials that we have to figure out what the side effects are of these if they fail, right? But the fact the government financed that, took on that risk, meant that as soon as the Moderna and the Pfizer passed in December, passed through clinical trials in December, they were immediately available. Tens of millions of doses were immediately available to the public. And that's why you see the red line here. These are the early months of 2021, especially the United States does much better at producing tens and hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines quicker than Europe, than India, who if I extended that chart out longer over longer periods of time, had ended up having much greater capacity to produce these things over the long term than we needed. So we largely got this piece of industrial policy right. Um, but of course, now it's over, right? This is not something that we're trying to trying to trying to extend. Okay. Semiconductors. Um, what was the problem? Well, people will tell you with a lot of different. I think from an economic perspective, the main problem, if there is a problem, is we've got excessive geographic concentration of production in East Asia. Yeah, there's a little bit of a problem of, of, um, of, of tensions with China and some of the made in China 2025 objectives that Lee laid out. China maybe wants to dominate this, this, this particular industry. Um, but at least for the high-end stuff, it wasn't there yet. But what is potentially a legitimate concern, especially for thinking of the highest and nodes of semiconductors and stuff that TSMC produces, Samsung produces, they, they produce it in a very small number of places. And in a world now where we have climate related shocks, massive storms or droughts, floods, things like that, earthquakes, right? Let alone pandemics, let alone geopolitical risks, North Korea, potential invasion, whatever, right? Having geographically concentrated production is just a really, really bad idea. So we need diversification there. That would sort of be my argument for um, why the CHIPS Act isn't as bad uh, as, it, as it possibly could. There is some underlying motivation for it. It's not an economic efficiency argument, but it is sort of a resilience diversification argument. Now, I, I would also argue from the U.S. side, we'd be equally happy if that diversification moved out of Taiwan, South Korea to Japan to Europe, right? And so that's why I'm heartened that we're starting to see some sort of coordination on subsidies or attempts to do so perhaps with our allies and friends when it comes to these, these sorts of things. Um, will it solve all of the problems? No, um, it's not necessarily gonna move the highest end chips uh, out of Taiwan and South Korea to the United States. Um, with the export controls cutting off the, the equipment to produce by indigenous Chinese firms, high-end semiconductors in China, all that's really going to leave for China in the short run is the production of legacy chips, right? What happens when we have a glut of those types of chips globally? Um, uh, even if we had a, a different global distribution of production from what we had during the pandemic, so if we had more than 12% of manufacturing capacity in the United States, less concentrated in, um, in Taiwan. So, would the shortage that played out in 2021 have been any, any different? I would argue no, right? Firms were, these firms were profit maximizing and doing probably what they should have when they shifted their orders, when the, when the car makers came to them, uh, when, when lockdowns happened in March of 2020, uh, and the car makers came to them and said, the semiconductor manufacturer said, we're pulling our orders. We don't want any chips. Nobody's driving around anymore. We don't need your semiconductors. The semiconductor company said, okay, we've got these consumer electronics companies. We've got, uh, Computer companies, everybody needs to school from home, um, work from home. They all want our chips. They're, they're, they're willing to pay us more because they want higher end chips. So we're going to shift our demand there. They did the right thing. It's not like if there was excess capacity sitting around. And even if 100% of world production were sitting in the United States, if American firms are profit maximizing, they would have done exactly the same thing, right? So that shortage problem was a weird kind of fluke of, of changes in supply and demand because driven by the pandemic, arguably, and really wouldn't look any differently, even if we had a different geographic footprint of manufacturing production. And it's also uh, likely to introduce some new challenges as well, the CHIPS Act. If we do ultimately end up taking some of this production away from uh, Taiwan and South Korea, these are hardly um, countries of concern for the United States. How do you compensate them? They're already feeling a little bit miffed about, uh, are we really friends in all of this, especially South Korea, I think. What happens, um, you know, when this was originally being thought of, the economy was doing relatively well. What happens, or at least the, the semiconductor industry was doing relatively well. Mm -hmm. Do these firms have the same incentives to invest? 
uh, as you know, we're reaching more of a trough for the industry, uh, what changes are happening there. And then if we do, at the end of the day, end up with global excess capacity for this industry, uh, what makes it so that we don't go back to this, Lee was talking about the 1980s in Japan, going back to you know, the trade wars and the semiconductors between the United States and Japan, South Korea and Taiwan, and maybe Europe, right? We have lots of trade remedies, anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties that segment the markets there. How do we know we're not headed back to that, that world? We haven't yet uh, talked about trading partners. Lastly, and I'm going to be run short on time here, clean energy, right? And this is probably the most difficult. Um, I guess one of the points on chips, this one is a little bit worrisome in that it does involve picking winners. This does involve the Commerce Department having to decide which firms are going to get $3 billion for a manufacturing facility, which ones aren't. And maybe they'll all get it at the end of the day, so there won't be any picking winners. Um, what's interesting about the, uh, the, the energy provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act, it's not largely uh, picking winners at least on the electric vehicle side, the policy, so what's the underlying problem? Climate change, got to do something about it, okay? Especially in the United States, Americans still driving internal combustion engine vehicles, we need them to switch to electric vehicles, okay? Consumer tax credits, so far, so, so good, right? We're, we're sort of the right policy, and we've got these extra things in there, we've got price caps in there, we try to incentivize the automakers, um, and income caps for the individuals, so not just rich people, but lower income people, trying to incentivize automakers to create electric vehicles for the masses, not just the high-end Teslas, Rivians, you know, Porsches, BMWs, but the stuff that everybody would drive to really make an impact on, on the climate. So what role for industrial policy here? Hmm, it's a little less clear, right? I think part of it is we're worried about similar sorts of China shock uh, legacy concerns, huge, in, in, you know, legacy automobile industry in the United States, in important swing states, hundreds of thousands of jobs, that are going to disappear because we're no longer going to need internal combustion engines. The entire supply chain is going to be disrupted, right? So the question is, well, you know, we could do um, a formal labor market policy to help those workers, or we could try to build a new auto automotive industry based on this electric vehicle technology um, to, to deal with it that way. Maybe, but I think this is probably not really going to work because those workers are going to be in different states and different locations and you know you don't really care when you lose your job at a gm plant um you know that, that used to make an ice vehicle um, that somebody else has got a job two states away in the united states that's not all that different for you than, than if that job is in mexico or europe or china right so as a labor market adjustment policy not not a great one um the other concern though is this geopolitical one which is that a lot of the uh, critical inputs that at least currently go into the, the technology for electric vehicle batteries uh, are primarily sourced from China, right? And we have seen China in the past um, use its market power on the supply side, restrict exports of whether you're talking about raw materials or even more mundanely, right? Not bans necessarily, but using export taxes, um, holding back rebates in, in VATs to be able to exert their market power to preference their consuming industries, their manufacturing industries, at the expense of competitors in the rest of the world. So there is a, an incentive for policymakers to try to break that supply chain, to break some of that dependence on China there. And so what they've done in the Inflation Reduction Act is to introduce this through industrial policy. Yes, consumer tax credits, additional on battery inputs satisfying these criteria, and the final vehicle being assembled in North America. Okay, and with my 30 seconds that are left, what problems did this create? Well, this created uh, huge problems with allies um, that, you know, Japan, South Korea, Europe, countries that are also important, that also have important uh, automotive industries uh, because automobiles assembled in those countries are not in North America, right? So uh, they became upset, uh, let alone the critical minerals part as well. Okay, so that was the initial version of the legislation back in August. What's happened since then? Well, the, the Biden administration has tried to accommodate creatively um, allies' concerns. So what did they do? Well, in December, at the end of December, uh, they said, well, there, actually, there's a separate track in the Inflation Reduction Act, not for consumer vehicles that you or I would get, but for commercial vehicles. Think of like tractor trailer trucks or delivery vans, things like that. Typically think of as commercial vehicles. Well, we can call a vehicle that you or I would obtain instead of buying it if we lease it. That's a commercial vehicle. Okay, so now all of a sudden it's available for these tax credits under this separate track, provided you lease it. Okay, um, well, that's fine, except 
None of those other criteria, so nothing about the price cap, the income cap, nothing about the battery sourcing part. I'm worried about China, countries of concern, supply chain, dominance, etc. None of those criteria are in this commercial vehicle track. So by the administration accommodating the concerns of allies and opening up the tax credits for them, it's weakening some of its other provisions in there that were about countries of concern uh, and in local assembly. All right, with that, there's other things of, of, of worry there, but I'm out of time. Um, this is still the TBD to be determined, right? We're at the early stages still of what the United States is doing on industrial policy. Um, so far, I think you can argue it, at least in part, is it's a practical response to the new world in which we live in. It's very different from here's five year plans, here's strategic industries, let's do this optimally and rationally. It may or may not work. Um, but uh, it's sort of very much a practical, how do we deal with these, these, these situations that we're uh, newly confronting today, these, these sorts of shocks. Um, but there's a whole laundry list of lessons so far and, and what we can do going forward. Thanks. Welcome, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I feel a little intimidated following these two incredible economists that have given you everything. So I'm gonna be the really boring lawyer in the room that tries to sort of figure out, okay, you've heard a lot from Lee about how all of this industrial policy and subsidies are working in China. We've heard a lot from Chad about how they're working here in the US. I'm gonna to try to at least tell the story about the rules that are connected to them and the rules that relate to them. And to some degree, tell a little bit of a story about what's different about how those rules have been applied to China versus the United States. Um, how has that difference played out? How has it gone? How are we doing on all of this? And then lastly, close with a little bit of like, where do we go from here? So I wanna start by sort of taking us back um, to when did these rules ever get applied to China? And when I say the rules, I'll be clear, the vast majority of what I'm talking about are the rules of the World Trade Organization the WTO. So again, they get applied to China when China joins the WTO in 2001 uh, as part of a process referred to as an accession. Um, and for me, I'm putting up here some things uh, to just give a little snapshot of literally how far China had to move in order to join the WTO. Um, in, before China joined the WTO, again, you, you, you think about this, they're joining the World Trade Organization that is all about trade. All right, but before China joined, there was not the right for anyone, Chinese or foreign, necessarily to import or export anything. All right, so how do you join a trading organization if no one actually has the right to trade? Mm. So one of the first things China had to do is say, actually, we will give everyone, foreign and domestic, the right to trade. So China committed right out within three years. There's going to be all enterprises, including foreign enterprises, have the right to trade all goods except for a minor list of items that was excluded from the trade rights. Second thing, what everybody noticed in China was almost all of the decisions are not made centrally. Um, there's even local provinces, et cetera, are governing rules about trade, um, even though they're in a province. And so again, China had to say, we're gonna make it uniform across China. If we've made a commitment in the WTO, we're gonna make that commitment apply equally, whether that's a, SE's a special economic zone, et cetera. Again, pretty, pretty big issue and that they would nullify, the central government would nullify any rules that were inconsistent. Thirdly, China, this is a pretty interesting one. You have to remember everybody complaining about how hard it was to figure out how to do anything in China in terms of how opaque everything was. You just could not figure out what the rules were. Again, China committing that only laws that are published and available were gonna be enforced. So if the rules had anything to do with trade, they had to be publicly available. And lastly, and this is, you know, again, where we get to our subsidies industrial policy that for state trading enterprises, so again, think state-owned enterprises, et cetera, they're, they're, China is committing to have a transparent practice and for the Chinese government to not interfere with direction or influence or purchasing decisions in terms of you know, quantity, price, country of origin, et cetera. These are pretty far-reaching commitments, okay? Arguably not that far beyond what everybody else in the WTO was doing, but really moving the needle for China. Okay, now we get to um, the WTO plus, if you will. So China not only had to commit to doing everything that most members had to do, they had to commit to doing more than 
All right. So the more than that that China has to commit to is um, things like, they may sound small, but translate every law, regulation, or measure that relates to trade into one of the official languages of the w of the WTO that largely means English, but it could mean French or Spanish, within 90 days of it being implemented. I mean, can you imagine in the United States if we said every single law, rule, regulation affecting trade within 90 days has to be translated into different languages? Mm, right out of the box, China agrees. Okay, national treatment, again, which is this general notion that you cannot discriminate. Once a good has been imported into the United States or into any country under WTO rules, you have to treat it no less favorably than you treat a domestic good. You can't discriminate as between the imported good or the domestic good. But with China, we went even further. It was not enough to just have it be applied to the goods. We said you, you cannot, as between a, a foreign individual enterprise or a foreign funded, foreign funded enterprise, no discrimination. So we extend this national treatment, no discrimination to include enterprises and all of their activities, not just the good itself, right? Um, uh, China, again, on, on thinking about these SOEs, uh, said it will allow prices for traded goods and services in every sector, again, except for a small list of items, would be determined by market forces. Again, this is a huge push when we think about now as we're, we're complaining about, about China and its non-market economy. It, China had to allow trade remedies, meaning anti-dumping duties, countervailing duties, and safeguards to be applied under sort of different rules than everybody else uh, to make it easier for other countries to apply them. Um, and it had to, this is something Chad touched on, it had to agree to eliminate all export taxes um, except for a list of, of certain items. So again, China is committing to go beyond what everybody else does as a part of getting into this WTO. All right, so um, how did we respond on this end? Again, so we go through this whole negotiation. Big vote has to happen in the Congress in order to let China into the WTO. We had to change what was referred to as permanent normal trade relations with China. So a big act of Congress. As part of that, um, what the Congress did is three things that, again, were not done for anybody else that was joining the WTO. A, we set up this, um, this um, uh, China e uh, Economic and Security Commission that would basically um, assess every single year and report to the Congress every single year on whether or not China's economic and trade relationships were creating any national security risks for the United States. And every year this commission has issued these reports. Every year, I will tell you, they are highly, highly critical of China and have been from the very beginning, literally from year one, uh, that these reports were issued. They were highly skeptical of whether or not China was going to live up to its commitments and, and made a number of those things. Secondly, again, unlike any other country that's joined the WTO, USTR, or United States Trade Representative's Office, has to issue a report every single year on whether China is or is not in compliance with its WTO obligations. Again, you can read them every year. I, I've read all of them. And, you know, again, you, you've seen varying degrees of comments about where China is. But again, this is somewhat unusual. And lastly, the United States implemented this special safeguard provision by saying, OK, anybody who has a concern about imports coming in from China as a result of their joining the WTO can easily go to the ITC, file this really quick, literally one page petition. The ITC will investigate. And if the ITC finds that you have market disruption, um, you get a remedy. You get extra duties. You get a safeguard put on those goods coming in from China. And again, I'll just admit that I was at the ITC as a commissioner when this went through, and I looked at this provision and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm never going to see my children because we're going to have <laughs> hundreds of these because it's a very low standard. It literally takes a one-page letter, and then everybody who was feeling flooded by imports coming in from China because of China joining the WTO is going to file these petitions, and we were going to have thousands of them in time. The entire time, I was there. Maybe I six, I guess I should say. Five of them, the president chose not to actually take any action. Only one of them moved forward. You know, so again, just just to, just to note. But again, I, I don't want to go through all of this in the interest of time. But but to me, it is it is at least worth remembering how much change occurred for China to join the WTO in terms of huge reductions in their tariffs, huge opening up of their markets, just huge changes across China as a result of the commitments that it made to join the WTO. So how's it going? All right. So again, you think, okay, China did all of these things. And I would say some of the initial reports from USTR and others were 
a lot about, wow, you know, China really did do all of these amazing things. You could watch the tariffs come tumbling down. You could watch all these regulations start to get published. You could watch all of these endeavors to try to unif create a uniform customs administration. Then here's where we end up, 2017. The Trump administration says it was a mistake to have let China into the WTO on the terms that we did because it was ineffective in, in securing China's embrace of an open market-oriented trade regime. So again, it, we're starting to now measure everything by whether or not we achieve this goal of having China become a market economy, right? That was really the rub, and that was an awful lot of what drove uh, this trade war. And again, I've copied these. These are Chad Bounce uh, data right down here on the China trade war um, that really shows you what happened in terms of the tariffs under this trade war. Why did we start the trade war? Again, as a result of this Section 301 action that was geared to things that China was alleged to have done, which arguably were violations of the commitments that it made under the WTO agreements. In other words, it was alleged in the 301 report to be all about its intellectual property violations, all about its theft of technology or forced transfers of technology. All of those were things that China committed not to do as part of its protocol of accession. So rather than bringing a dispute at the WTO or challenging China, the, the Trump administration chose to go this route of filing this Section 301 report and ultimately putting in all of these duties on, on, onto China. So again, we've opted for this very sort of unilateral, if you will, um, approach. So again, just to sort of think about the results of how, what has come of this um, and what does it mean. I mean, as I mentioned, one, one, um, one to, uh, of these individual selective safeguards, a whole lot of anti-dumping and countervailing duty actions, um, a limited number of WTO disputes. In other words, there were lots and lots of places in which you could have said China you violated and we could have brought it a WTO case. The United States has brought 23 cases. We've won every single one of them that's gone through the whole stage. Eight of them we settled. Three of them are still pending. In other words, they haven't been resolved. Um, mostly because the United States has not pressed them to be resolved. The rest of the world filed 26. So again, we filed the, the majority. And our cases tended to be bigger, more systemic, et cetera, rather than the cases that the rest of the world filed. We have all these 301 duties still in place on China. China's retaliatory duties in, against us still in place. You know, again, that goes back to that chart. We still have duties on steel and aluminum in the name of national security. We now have all new export controls. We now have all of these efforts to include this non-market economy sort of notion within all of these other industrial policies. Um, so we now have, uh, we're negotiating allegedly a green steel and aluminum arrangement with the European Union. So it's in part about with the carbon content of the steel and the aluminum, but it also is saying you can't be in this club if you are a non-market economy. So we're adding this concepts of non-market economy, subsidized economies into what is otherwise supposed to be a climate change measure. And, and as Chad has already mentioned, we now have within the chips and the IRA, this notion of you can't qualify for the subsidy and you can't do any business if you get the subsidy with anybody that is a foreign um, entity of concern, which means anybody that is owned, controlled, or subject to the jurisdiction of China. So again, you cannot engage in any business if you are receiving one of these subsidies with any uh, foreign entity of concern. All right, two policy things that are happening at this, and in the interest of time, I might even skip over this one, but two uh, policy things that are coming out of this. One is a huge push to say that whatever special privileges China still has as a result of it being able to declare itself to be a developing country at the WTO, we're gonna take that away. We're gonna take it away and we're gonna say, you know, you can't have any of those special privileges, um, the U.S. has proposed doing this in one way at the WTO to define what is a developing country, or at least what cannot be a developing country. And secondly, you just saw last week the United States House of, House of Representatives pass the um, PRC is not a developing country act to basically say, in all instances, China cannot be considered a developing country. So there is this whole pathway to take away any, any whatever privileges you may have um, as a result of being considered a developing country. The second path is much more the significant one, which is what are we gonna do about subsidies? So again, clearly we already have subsidies disciplines that all of you know about. 
Um, basically, if a good, a good is subsidized, if you got a financial contribution by a government or a public body that gave you a benefit, all right? And now you've got a subsidy. Um, the concern is that then is unfair because your competitor didn't get a subsidy. So there are disciplines, either countervailing duties or so-called adverse effects cases that you can bring. Chad and I, again, and I think Chad was presenting his paper, our, our collective paper of lots of problems with how effective these remedies are and lots of reasons why that, that we could talk about. But nonetheless, those, those disciplines are there. One that, again, I just want to touch on is the one on prohibited subsidies. Okay, so this is a, a, a pledge, and it's a pledge by the United States and every other member of the WTO. And the way it says is this, you shall not grant or maintain a prohibited subsidy. So the United States has already committed not to grant a local content subsidy. Yet what is the IRA? and local content subsidies. So again, we are in blatant violation of our WTO obligations when we do that. And yet now we are trying again to say, but we want to condemn China for its subsidies, yet we are doing, you know, again, equally inconsistent things. So again, on top of all of the other things that China committed to in the subsidy state-owned enterprises realm, China also made a whole lot of additional commitments um, that it would, again, all of its state-owned and state-invested enterprises are going to make purchases and sales based solely on commercial considerations, price, quality, marketability, and availability. This is an absolute commitment by China as part of its protocol of accession. Um, it pledged that all of its enterprises would be available, and again, that foreigners could bid, could buy and sell to all of its state-owned enterprises, that the government of China would not try to influence anything going on in these state-owned enterprises, and that it would permit, you know, again, these countervailing duties to be applied using these alternative benchmarks. So what happened? Uh, again, I think everybody has documented it very well. Clearly, China made a huge U-turn away from where it had been. I mean, it had been on a path towards more market opening. As I said, when it joined the WTO in 2001, a huge amount of opening and a huge amount of change. It then did a complete U-turn. Um, you started seeing huge numbers of uh, state-owned enterprises come under the auspices of uh, SASEC, the State-Owned Asset Supervision Administration. You started seeing the state-owned enterprises be merged with each other. I think a lot of the data that Lee is pointing out about what happened to a lot of these companies that got a lot of the subsidies is, again, part of this. You started seeing the finance side of the equation also be orchestrated where the biggest banks were also being sort of centrally supervised and a lot of the money. So again, bottom line is you, and then you saw China say that every, every entity, um, including foreign owned entities, joint ventures, everybody has to have a communist party cell uh, with located within it. And it started to be very clear that if you um, were sitting on that board and you did not vote how the communist party member voted, your company would start not getting permits, not getting licenses, so effectively, you have Communist Party control of every enterprise in China. There's a Communist Party cell everywhere they're controlling. So between these three things, you are just starting to see huge, huge amounts of state party control over everything in the Chinese economy. Um, and at the same time, you saw this huge explosive growth, growth of all of the state-owned enterprises. All right. So clearly, this is not working. I mean, these rules and these disciplines and what's happening in China are coming into this where all of these commitments were made by China about what it was going to do with its state-owned enterprises and all the rules are there. And on the other hand, you have the U-turn and everything that comes of it. So for me, I started thinking about, so why, what, what's the argument for why we need to change uh, where we are right now? For me, again, I, I'm still coming from the place where I think the WTO is worth at least considering as a tool, as one of a tool uh, of the tools that we can use to try to think about this. I mean, part of it is to push back a little bit on the narrative that you're currently hearing. Uh, you heard it in the Trump administration and you're still hearing it in the Biden administration, which is if the WTO cannot fix our problem with China, then the WTO is worthless. Let's not spend any time or energy worrying about the WTO because all we care about is whether it can solve the China problem. And if it can't, never mind. Secondly, I think there is a, a, a growing concern that if we're going to keep doing this, if we're going to keep passing IRA kind of legislation that blatantly violates our WTO obligations, maybe you don't, we don't want a WTO. 
that's going to be out there criticizing us, reminding us that we have an obligation, that we've just violated it. Um, so maybe we don't want to have a WTO anymore that tells us that we have to play by the rules just like everybody else. Hmm. Uh, where does that leave us? I will say, I've just come back from, from Geneva a couple weeks ago, and in general, my concern is at this moment in time, as between the United States and China, China is perceived as the more responsible player. Uh, within the WTO and the rules-based system um, as much more of the appropriate country to follow uh, in a better position from a legal and sort of, if you will, moral high road standpoint, it would, as between the United States and China, it would be China um, that, would, that would occupy that seat. Maybe worrying for those of us that care about the WTO and, and understand the role that the United States has played. You know, a huge worry that the subsidies war that we're getting ready to go down with um, is going to look a lot like the Boeing Airways where we're just going to end up in constant litigation against each other, where the subsidies are ending up with less innovative companies and all of the things that, that Lee has talked about as happening in China, are we going to start seeing happening here? You know, and, and lastly, you know, my real concern is, you know, addressing climate change is going to require all of us to actually be much more on the same page, all working together, and we cannot afford to have a lot of the fragmentation um, that is going to be coming about if we end up with all these local content requirements. So um, just to close with kind of where do we go from here? So I'm willing to throw out three thoughts that I've had on, on sort of what, what do we really need to do. I mean, first is I, I think we absolutely have to work more cooperatively um, with and, and accept some of the basic disciplines on discrimination. We just should not be engaging in national treatment violations or MFN discrimination, where we just simply say, I'm going to discriminate against you because you're X or you're Y. Uh, we, we, we need to think about whether that's helping or hurting. If you think about it, we have this good idea to have a green steel and an aluminum arrangement where we would agree that there are going to be carbon intensive standards about trade in steel and aluminum and that we're going to live with those standards and that we can charge additional tariffs or put other restraints on dirty steel and aluminum in order to encourage everybody to engage in the production of and sale of green stuff. Great. And then we add on to it a non-market economy. And so all of a sudden it becomes something else other than a climate change measure and it will weaken it. Again, if we keep doing local content requirements, we're headed down the road of, of, all, of all of these legal fights where we're going to constantly be challenged because those are, those are violations. Um, um, and again, I think there can be clear exceptions to everything I've just said for genuine national security concerns. If we have general national security concerns in China, which we do, over high-end chips and other national security things, can you take those out of the equation and restrict trading those? Absolutely, yes. So we need to be using the national security exception for things that are actually of national security concern. And there can be a lot of international cooperation on what fits fairly into, into the framework of, of national security. Secondly, to me, is we need to revise our subsidy disciplines. They're clearly not working. I mean, there's no question. I mean, they're, they're not working. Um, they're not disciplining us. They're not disciplining China. They're not disciplining in the way that they were designed to do. Um, so to me, a lot of things that could be done one is to just improve the notifications. Part of it is it's hard. I mean, I, I commend Lee for the work that he's done, but it's generally hard to figure out what's happening in everybody's subsidies around the world. Secondly, um, we used to have a notion that you could distinguish, if you will, a good from a bad subsidy, and that you could do things that would lift up the good subsidies, and you could do things to prohibit the bad ones. To me, we need to go back there um, and, and really think about it now in the framework of climate change, in the framework of global pandemics, in the framework of, uh, of, of the need to address development and income inequality, you could rethink this idea of how do you define a good versus a bad subsidy, and how do you put prohibitions on the bad and, and uplift the good, um, and we need better remedies. And the third thing I will say we clearly need is to pay attention to international standards. Because of all of the things that's out there, whether it's in climate change and others, it's going to cause a lot of fragmentation. It's if, if we're all operating under different standards. Um, we're going to end up with, again, if you have local content requirements that require everything to be built here, you built to those standards. And they're not operable with everybody else's. And so, again, to me, these, these are the things. In terms of the, the approaches to, to subsidies, just my thinking had been um, to, to mirror a little bit of what was done in the agreement on agriculture to try to figure out a way to place some overall limits, but to, again, create these categories of what could be viewed as 
green or good subsidies, I mean, valuable, and those that shouldn't count in whatever kind of overall limit. So I, I remain an optimist that the WTO and the idea of multilateralism and multilateral tools can be one, it will not be the only solution, but it can be one tool that we should be using as we think about how to shape our own industrial policy and how to respond to China's. I don't know if there are already questions. If we, okay, then I, I will give away my privilege and, and start taking questions right away. Yes, please. Hi, this is Marilee. Oh, I'm oh, thanks. Marilee, I'm a reporter with International Trade today. I have questions for Dr. Hellman. Um, or I don't know if you have the box. Jennifer's good. <laughs> Jennifer Hellman. Um, one is what you were talking about that we're breaking the rules because of the domestic content requirements, but they're not technically domestic. They do cover Mexico and Canada and um, NAFTA and then USMCA gave it a 25% preference for trucks made somewhere in those three countries. That seems almost as significant, if not more significant financially than the tax credits under IRA. So why is this something that is different from a WTO perspective? The other question I had is you said you're an optimist on getting new subsidy disciplines at the WTO, but obviously uh, the West defined broadly as Lee talked about, their concern is they want China to do less subsidies. So why would China agree to a cap that would constrain China? Okay, I'll, uh, well, first on the, on the um, IRA violations, uh, it, it's more that it's a violation of the prohibited subsidy rules. So again, the prohibited subsidy rules just simply say, again, you shall not grant or maintain a subsidy that privileges use of, um, a, uh, domestic product over imported product. And this is clearly, again, you're, you're right that you could then define domestic to include Canada or Mexico. That doesn't change the fact that it is discriminatory against autos made in Europe, autos made in Japan, autos made in Korea, autos made anywhere other than Mexico or Canada are being discriminated against. Um, and, and that is where the violation occurs. It is in the discrimination against against those. Um, you know, the Canada Preference Program, again, falls probably under, you are allowed to engage in free trade agreements or preferential agreements, and those are excluded from the rules under Article 24 of the GATT. So I, my sense is anything under the USMCA is probably okay in the sense that it is, those are, those are an exception to the rules be, because, because it's done under the auspices of a free trade agreement. I, I do think those are distinguishable um, on the new subsidies discipline. I, I'm not saying I'm optimistic we're going to get overall WTO rules. I'm saying that there is a better way to use the existing WTO rules that we have not done, uh, you know, as significantly against China or others. Um, and secondly, that you can start negotiating new rules like this green steel and aluminum arrangement. In other words, various forms of cooperative arrangements to try to deal with some of these very common problems, I would say, especially starting with climate change, where you could come up with, I mean, some people would call it a carbon club, others, you know, there's various ways that you could come up with plurilateral arrangements. Again, my view is you can do them and you can do them consistently with your WTO obligations. So they wouldn't necessarily be formally under the auspices of the WTO, but my own view is do both, do both. Uh, because at some level, the WTO remains um, having those basic bottom line discriminatory tools that should be that should be used. So let me take a, uh, two, three more questions. Yes, Ashwin. This is a question for Lee, the very interesting presentation. I, I think the, um, you could maybe have even more fundamental critique of the Chinese industry policy in terms of its design thinking, right? So what gives productivity boost is actually not inventive activity. That may give you that a few years later. It is really adoption, right? So, and the Chinese <coughs> industry policy is actually counterproductive from that point of view. If a firm is already busily adopting foreign technology, that actually has a better chance of improving the productivity 
then reinventing the whole thing from the very beginning, right? So there's just some fundamental design flaw. That's quite different from the US industry policy, which is more about scaling and, and, and that. The other is that um, I think it's hard to sort of do this kind of study in part because the TFP producers are not necessarily benefiting from the technology, right? If you think about Xerox, uh, it came up with many, many things, but it didn't become the beneficiary. So the productivity in fact shows up in Apple and other companies, whereas uh, Xerox went into bankruptcy. But I think that one piece of evidence in support of your work is that if that's the right thinking, there must be product productivity spillover effects. But from the aggregate economy-wide statistic, we just don't see that, right? So there's no firm level productivity effect. There's no economy level. Great. Let me be a couple more questions. Do you have a? Um, so I, I think all of your suggestions were very, uh, very, very sensible. But I think there's one topic that you didn't cover, which is, um, which in the 301 report very strongly asserted that there was uh, economic regression, which meant that there was a use of subsidies to uh, capture and uh, entire industries at a cost uh, to the productivity, but at a, the, 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 the gain, the strategy was to kill the opponent and then take over the industry and then raise prices in, at, at the end. And there was a list in the 301 report of maybe 20 examples of this uh, from tires to penicillin, and you didn't address that particular topic in your presentation. One more, one more question. Um, yeah, this is a question for Mr. Lee. Um, you you mentioned that uh, the uh, Make in China innovation policy subsidies are not working. Uh, now, uh, in today's conference, there wasn't much talk about that the Chinese have been stealing technology, uh, either from the United States or from, um, from the West. Um, given that you need money to even steal technology, so maybe those subsidies in your study wouldn't show the effect if there was such a thing done and new technologies were obtained. Uh, and uh, just to, it, did your study look into NIO, N-I-O? Uh, because their stocks haven't been doing very well, even though they're in electric cars. So I'm just curious if your study has seen anything on them. Um, uh, sure, sure. So, um, uh, yeah, 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 I think my answer is yes, right? I think I agree with both your points. Um, you know, uh, adoption and innovation are important for firms in every country. Um, and I think, um, you know, trying to uh, restrict uh, adoption and, and push innovation uh, too much uh, is, is another source of inefic inefficiency. Um, I think I also agree with your second point. Uh, it is certainly possible that innovation could, you know, generate no, uh, you know, measure productivity benefit for the seller, but it could it all flow downstream. Uh, and you cited the interesting example of Xerox, but there are lots of other, you know, high tech companies in Silicon Valley that actually have, have been able to make some money from their innovation, at least for a while. So it would have been surprising if every single Chinese company that got the subsidy generated useful innovation and wasn't able to appropriate any of the gains for itself. But you rightly point to the fact that at the aggregate level, productivity has also been declining. Um, so I, I think these are great points. Uh, and we'll add them to the next version of the paper, and we will that you will acknowledge your uh, you know, role in raising this. <laughs> with, with regards to sort of economic aggression um, and using subsidies to steal an entire industry, so I mean, obviously there's a limit to our data, right? It's you know subsidies that were reported starting in 2007 by listed firms, right? So there's a lot that we're not capturing. Um, I mean, that being said, right, I mean, if companies were actually taking this approach, right, kind of squeezing out their competitors and then jacking up prices massively, it would actually show up in our data as a productivity boom, right, because we're measuring output and a revenue, and we're measuring output as revenue, not, you know, physical quantity produced. 
right? Which means, you know, a big increase in profit would show up as an increase in total factor productivity as we're measuring it. And we don't see that. So at least over, you know, the, the data window that's available to us, we're not picking up this much. So with regard to stealing technology, um, I have another uh, publication, right? A, a Peterson policy brief that looks at the phenomenon of forced technology transfer. Um, I mean, that, that one is even harder to study, right? I mean, you know, we kind of lucked into the fact that, you know, my, my student co-authors found this uh, data that's publicly available. It really does measure a component of subsidies, I think, reasonably well. Of course, technology transfer is hard, right? Because, uh, or, or technology theft is hard, um, you know, because, um, you know, to the extent that actual theft is taking place, the thieves aren't going to raise their hands or run up the flag and say, hey, you know, I'm a thief, right? Um, and often the companies that have been the victim of technology, forced technology transfer or technology theft also have complicated incentives when it comes to telling the full story about what happened, right? I um, mean, if they complain too much, they can find themselves locked out of the biggest market in the world for their output. So kind of really interesting issue um, and very, very hard to investigate. <clears throat> I have just one last question for Chad, actually. I'm going to ask this question. I, I, I want you to make a few more tasks. Um, with everything that we have been discussing in this, in this panel, right, Jennifer and, and Lee and Chad, you know, the full company requirements, the two sets of industry policies, what's your forecast on the landscape of the innovation? Do, are we going to see things similar, analogous to trade blocks in terms of two major innovation blocks that do their own innovations? With the requirements, and then third countries will have to kind of choose between the two in terms of who to trade components with, who to trade. You know, what's your sense on you know the outlook? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I don't have a strong forecast. Um, I think this was obviously a concern and worry that we saw and emerged, you know, during the Cold War and something that could possibly happen. But I think today is fundamentally different. Um, with the, it's hard to restrict the flow of information today um, compared to 50 years ago because of the internet, because of you know as much localization has taken place. Even with even with COVID and lockdowns, right? Times one is great, but information still flowed. So, um, but it may come up endogenously if countries adopt standards that require the bifurcation. I think that that could possibly be the case. Um, but it's interesting, you still see today, right, even despite the U.S.-China tensions and even in something like the electric vehicles story, right, you've got major American companies like Ford um, choosing to do major deals with large Chinese companies, CATL, um, you know, and license their technology. And so maybe, maybe it won't end up that way, right? And so I guess... One thing I learned from uh, President Trump was to never forecast. I yeah. <laughs> heard that this morning too from uh, Paris, which, you know, when we make a forecast, we always associate a probability with that. So we have room for adjustments later. But thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists.